Hi everyone, thanks for joining. This is John Jay and today I'm gonna to talk about uh, what I'm gonna call the title of, is, it's gonna be the uh, pre and post nuptial agreement for families and for couples. And uh, I guess the, the beginning title to get one, everyone's attention is divorcing the state. We, we've overlooked this part. And the reason why I've been motivated to talk about this is because I've been watching the discussion on the latest social trend, I suppose, where men have decided not to get married because they think that would prevent them from having their stuff pillaged uh, later on in a divorce proceeding or a separation agreement or something like that, uh, and vice versa, but mostly it's, it's the men. Um, since women initiate, uh, I apparently from all these interviews I'm learning, 8% uh, of divorces and separations. Now, what people don't realize is that you don't have to be married to suffer the same consequences. And I'm going to just point out that it's the state, it's the, it's the court system that is being used to subsidize divorce. There's an incentive for women to divorce a man. There's an incentive for a woman to make a complaint against a man. Maybe they're living together or they have some arrangement where she could make a complaint. And I'm not just going to blame only women, but I'm just going off that statistic, okay? So I'm not just biased against women. I'm just telling you that this, <clears throat> this subject originates from the fact that 80% of women typically are the ones that initiate separations and divorces. And they do that using the power of the state. They do that using the police power. And they're paid to do it. They're rewarded. They get money and so forth. And so... <clears throat> Whether or not you actually have a marriage agreement, my wife and I have been married for 23 years. We don't have a marriage license, but the state would easily recognize our marriage. Uh, if I had a living girlfriend, that would be, you know, say a living girlfriend of minimum, let's say six months, the court would recognize, uh, or let's say it this way, the court would take jurisdiction. Now, maybe I'm wrong on the six months. It could be two years. I'm not sure, depending on what state you're in. I'm in Florida. So let's just say six months. So you're not immune from these problems. So I know this is gonna sound unrealistic in some cases because you're gonna to think to yourself, how am I supposed to get this person I care about or that I wanna be with to agree to this sort of thing? And yeah, you do have to have an agreement. There has to be at some point an overt consent, some evidence of consent that you agree to certain things. Now that could just be simply a, a paragraph of text. It doesn't have to be complicated, right? And the idea behind what I'm gonna show you is that you're divorcing the state so that the laws and conditions and terms, and I'm going to call it arbitrary terms, cannot be used against you and your property, speaking for men, okay, cannot be used against men to, and cannot be used to subsidize divorce and reward women for initiating these types of things. In fact, we can write an agreement, you'll find out that we can write an agreement that would discourage a woman from initiating a separation or a divorce or trying to get some sort of claim, financial claim against the man, just because she's in the household. Now, of course, this works both ways, but again, I'm going off the, the statistic here. So the first thing we can do, and I'm not gonna show you this agreement because it's kind of dangerous if I'm gonna make it look like your life is much simpler or better, or you have some sort of magic wand, that if you have this document, that all of a sudden everything in your life is better. It's not like that. <clears throat> Every document is a little different. Every uh, agreement is a little bit different. It has to be written according to your situation. It has to be formed uh, to fit your lifestyle. But let me just show you the basic uh, concepts of how this plays out. So the first thing we do is let's, let's identify some relationships. First relationship, let's just say uh, a family, mom and a dad and some, and some children, okay? The mom and the dad, before they have children, are husband and wife, and that's what they are, only husband and wife. Or let's just say boyfriend, girlfriend, live in couples, okay? Uh, that is a private relationship. No one else is in that relationship. No one else can be in that relationship. It's exclusive to those two people. So let's call that a private membership association. It is outside the purview of the state's jurisdiction. Already, from the beginning, what we, the problem we run into is we don't realize this, right? We think we can just go to the court every time we have a problem in our lives. And the court says, great, thank you very much, because the court is a business. It is a business. It's a franchise. So in any case, understand what you have. Your initial relationship, man, woman, husband, wife, whatever, that is 
a private membership association. We bring in some children, forget pets. I'm, I'm talking about people. So we bring in children, whether you've adopted them or whatever the deal is, they're your own children. Now you have a different private membership association. You got the mom and the dad and the children. The children are not by themselves in association, okay? They have to be with the parents until they're adults. So you have the private membership association that includes the mom and the dad and the children. And whether or not there's children, you still have the original association, which is the husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, or mom and dad, if you want to call it that. Okay, so there's really two associations there. It's important to make that distinction. And in that relationship, to make that function on a day-to-day -day basis, you need stuff. You need property, you need money, you need cash flow. And so these are the things at risk. And so here's the way we what we want to do, because the problem that, that we're we're not really comprehending here that I'm listening to all these interviews and, and I listen to the attorneys from Florida. Okay. And I listen to how they disrespect agreements. I listen to them talking about uh, prenuptial and postnuptial agreements are important. And then in the next breath, they talk about how they succeeded at breaking through them. It's despicable. You have to respect agreements. Okay. If you're a lawyer, if you're a bar member, shame on you for talking about selling your client a postnuptial or prenuptial agreement, and in the same breath, talk about how you were succeeded at breaking one in another case. That is not what they're for. They're supposed to be respected. That is not what your job is, okay? Well, maybe I should take that back because the attorney's job is to take property so and convert it. So it's really be aware of what you're dealing with too. This, by the way, I, as you can tell, I, I have a bias against lawyers. So that's another motivating factor for me to do this. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a bar member. I never would be. So we have this these, uh, relationship. There's several types of relationships going on here, okay? And to make this work, we have property. So when I say property, I'm talking about, there's a few things here. We got three groups of property. We got real estate, okay? So the family itself, the husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, they live in a place. Presumably it's a you know building, not a car or something. So you live in a building, you rent a place, you, you buy a house or whatever. Uh, and you would then have chattels, things in the household. You got furniture, you got appliances, electronics. These are these things, okay? These are things that come into play when you're talking about divorce or separation, okay? That's my stuff. I'm taking it with me, <laughs> this sort of thing. Uh, and then you have other types of property, which are known as intangible private property rights. These are the rights that you have to make decisions every day. These are the rights you have, that the right that actually formed the association in the first place. You have a right to choose a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife. You have a right to, to bring children into the world and you exercise those rights. And these are intangible private property rights. You also have other private rights and we'll get into that. But because by default, you haven't become the good steward of these rights and this property, and this relationship, you haven't actually become an adult and acted like an adult and taken responsibility for this relationship. You just by default fell into the relationship just like you did in junior high school and high school. It wasn't, it wasn't a moral act. But when we get out into the world, it becomes a moral act. And so for, for most people, the reason why we're having these problems is because I think by default, we just go by default. We just do our thing and you know, we, we don't really have a rational understanding of the future. We don't deliberately plan for the future. And I can tell you this right now. I have clients that are high net worth and they use marriage very pragmatically. Marriage is a tool in managing wealth and maintaining wealth, preserving wealth. Okay. Um, we don't use it that way. If we're middle class or whatever, we don't see these things. So I'm just trying to share with you some of the, some of the ways that some of the concepts here that are used by very wealthy people. They're not going to share this with you unless you really have a close relationship with them. So we have marital assets, but it's not really assets. An asset, let's leave you, the proper accounting term for asset is something that uh, is uh, that you don't work for, that you own, possibly. You own a portion of, and it, it pays you on a regular basis, okay? That's an asset. Your car is not your asset. Your house is not your asset. Your 401k is not your asset, okay? It's someone else's. Someone else is benefiting financially from this. You're the, you're the debtor. You're the one who, with the liability in those cases. Now, if you own a duplex in your neighborhood, that could be an asset. Hopefully, it's got positive cash flow. I would say that's an asset. You're not, it's not your job, but you own it, and the people hopefully got tenants in there, and they're renting, and they're paying, and it's working out really well. That's an asset, okay? Marital property 
this confuse they confuse the term marital assets. Okay, marital property is all the chattels in the household. So, so what we do in the this postnuptial agreement, I'm just going to call it postnuptial agreement. It could be prenuptial. It doesn't have to be from a marriage. It could be for couples, live-in couples. Okay, what we're going to do is convey the ownership of the property, the things that make your life comfortable, right? Furniture, fixtures in the house, clothing, family heirlooms, okay? Electronics, appliances, all these things we're gonna convey simply by declaring the existence of a trust inside the postnuptial agreement. So we declare the existence of a trust and yeah, we can write up a trust agreement. That's not important. What's important is that we declare the existence of a trust and we describe what's in the trust. So all the things that are in the household that make the marriage work, that make the family work, the thing that, you know, the remote control that turns on the TV, you know, the TV, all these things that make your life comfortable, all those are now held in trust for the benefit of beneficiaries. Well, guess what? They were already being used for the benefit of beneficiaries. We just never said it like that. We, we just never said who the trustee was. Well, who's the trustee? It's probably the mom and the dad who bought those things, right? It's probably the dad who paid for these things, right? Whoever paid for these things, or like like the way my wife works, and if I pay for something, she sees that it's hers, and fine, you know. So it's you know it's ours, right? So the mom and the dad typically would be the trustee, and the beneficiary is possibly the mom and the dad, but also the children. Um, but in any case, I'm just speaking generically here. So we declare the existence existence of a trust. We identify the trust property, and we remove all the chattels from the marital community. Why do we do that? Okay. The trust is written in a way that it will remove the chattels from the marital community because if, if that is not part of the marital community, it's not something that can be discussed. If there's a dispute or a divorce and it goes before a judge, and I'm gonna show you how to get out of that situation, but let's just say it goes before a judge or an arbitrator, a third party for dispute resolution, okay? That is not on the table. It's already a, a settled matter. What we want to try to do is be responsible for our relationships. Stuff is important in our relationships. So is money, right? The things that money can buy are important. They become important in our relationships. Let's use them. Let's describe them the, in the way that they are actually being used. They are being used to benefit us. So someone has to be the trustee and someone has to be the beneficiary. So let's declare that and therefore remove the property, all the chattels from the marital community. And it's no longer on the table in the event of separation or divorce or any disputes of this kind. There is nothing. This is what rich people do, by the way. Rich people remove property from their estate so that there is nothing to probate, except maybe an old pickup truck, which is the joke. Okay, this is how it works. So. It's not so much res judicata. Res judicata means it's already been adjudicated. And a judge would say, well, yeah, if I didn't sign off on it, then it wasn't adjudicated. I'm going to tell you that because we created the court system, we have the, we have the legal authority to adjudicate matters. Okay. When you create this trust, when you, when you declare the existence of a trust and you secured and identified the ownership and how the property's held, You've adjudicated the property rights of the chattels for the marital community property. And it cannot be revisited. You've divested anyone. Even if you ask for someone to get involved with a dispute in the marriage or relationship, that trust holds all the chattels and it's not part of the discussion. It's a settled matter, not part of the marital estate anymore. However, all the things in that trust still serve the marital community and will continue to serve the marital community even if the marriage results in a divorce now a lot of this that i'm talking about here i'm not trying to talk about divorce what i'm talking about is let's get the state out of your relationship let's say you have a boyfriend girlfriend situation the state's in there you just don't know it yet because one of you can go to the court and petition for separation and the court will recognize it and take jurisdiction and you can't do anything about it because you didn't set it up properly I'm showing you right now how to divorce the state and prevent the state. I say divorce because it's dramatic, but let's prevent the state from applying its arbitrary terms and conditions. Where do those come from? Your state legislature, where do those come from? Like who gets what property? Where'd all that come from? Some legislators that don't know you, corporation that doesn't know you, 
why not use the standards that are already part of your relationship? So let's go on to, let's go on to, um, what do we do about the use of resources in the relationship? Well, that's already established, right? Because you figured out how to, who's going to pay the bills and how it's going to work. What percentage goes here? What percentage goes there? How much money is going to be allocated for different things? Uh, how much money we're going to allocate for Christmas presents, right? Uh, the children's clothing or whatever pleasures you have in your relationship. That money, even if you never even gave it a second thought, the record of how you spent your money is the agreement, let's just call it. This is how, actually, this is how courts uh, solve problems where there's no written agreement. They actually go to financial transactions, the judges do, and they review how the money flowed, what it was used for, the ratios, percentages, and how it was allocated. And from there, they reverse engineer agreements, provisions of an agreement between the in the relationship or whatever it was, part business partners, marriage, whatever. What I'm saying is, if there's going to be a separation, like a person leaves the household for some reason, then the, the money, the way it was allocated, should be consistent, like same ratios. If, if Johnny, you know, the little boy that's, you know, the child, uh, got so much money uh, or so much money was allocated for him to buy clothing every year, well, then that number should be about the same, right? It should be, the ratio should be about the same. We shouldn't be following the state's guidelines. Let's just get rid of the trial court. Let's just get rid of family court. Let's use our family as the court. Our family, our relationship, like I described earlier, the relationship between the husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, and then you have the relationship with the, all the children. This is, this has the same legal authority as a court. We just don't realize that. The parents have, and the, the, the two people, the adults, have all the authority that a judge does they just fail to exercise it. They think they want, you know, they're watching TV, they're watching Judge Judy, they're watching, they're listening to their friends, and they they learn by example. They're not they're not learning from actually studying law. So the parents can exercise their authority now. They should plan, just like you plan for the weather, okay? Just like you plan for retirement. What the heck? You're not even planning for a marriage. You're not planning for the ugly event where you want to separate. Hopefully that never happens. But if it did, did you ever consider that? Don't you ever plan for, and I've had this discussion with my parents before they died. What about their stuff, right? Hey, dad, when you, when you die, what do you want to be done with your stuff? I've had this conversation with my dad. He was cool with that. My parents were interesting. That I could, I could talk to them like that, but it's uncomfortable. It sounds morbid. But whoever has a conversation about, hey, honey, if you just hate me one day and you want to take my stuff or something, what does that look like? Let's work that out now. Let's be mature, okay? I think the first measure of what we want to do is not so much the other person involved. It's about let's protect this relationship from third parties. The third parties that want to ar apply arbitrary conditions that they don't know us. Let's divorce the state, meaning Let's get rid of the ability of the trial court to come into our marriage or relationship or live-in couples relationship uh, or interfere with our parents and I'm, I'm sorry, with interfere with the children. And here's where we get into the issue of once we figure this out, okay, just like I just described, if you have a settled matter, it can't be revisited. Okay. If you have, for example, if you have in this agreement, we get into establishing child support and custody. This has to do with who makes the money. This has to do with what makes sense, okay? This can be settled right now. This can be settled in a postnuptial agreement, prenuptial agreement. Custody. Let's just talk about custody for a second. If we already have that matter settled, the state can't intervene. Now, there's an exception to this. If there's abuse or neglect, we can even deal with that to some extent. But when it comes to abuse or neglect, by having an agreement of this nature, it puts the brakes on the state. Now, the state will just run you over without an evidentiary hearing on the claim that there's abuse or neglect, and they will just literally wipe you out. Okay? I've, I've seen this before. However, even if that were to happen, if you had a postnuptial agreement, you would be protected. They would put the brakes on the process, and the court would then have to have an evidentiary hearing. Now, I'm going to show you something really powerful. This is part of the postnuptial agreement. This is why it's going to work. So that's just child support. But what about child, not really child support, it's about child custody. If I have this agreement 
I can prevent the state from taking custody of my children because I've already settled that matter. Why? How? Because I exercised an intangible private property right. I did that in writing and I settled the matter before the court got involved, before the state got involved. And yeah, maybe that someone opened a can of worms, so to speak, with a claim of abuse or neglect. Hopefully there wasn't abuse or neglect. And I can deal with that now because I have a written agreement. I've already accounted for the situation. So that's child custody. Child support is similar because child support, like I was explaining before, is based upon how the child was, was supported before the change in the relationship, if there is going to be a change, like if one, is, one person is going to leave, husband or wife is going to leave, mom, dad is going to leave, right? So that is already a settled matter. And then we get into alimony. Well, it costs money. Let's say that let's say the dad is the one bringing the money, and the mom stays home and takes care of the family. Simple version. Well, if one person leaves, let's say the mom leaves, she had the use of some resources. She needs to. She needs the continued use of resources, and maybe it's going to be a little bit more expensive. Maybe it's going to cost a little bit more uh, so that she can sustain herself for a period of time. There has to be an arrangement. And again, we can settle this matter in already in a postnatal agreement. Let's say we don't really, let's say we kind of settle the matter, but we leave it a little open because we're not sure. We don't even really want to talk about that situation, but we're just kind of barely touching the surface. But we, we kind of put something in writing. Okay? We've got a framework there. What we want to then do is bring in, not the court, we want to bring in where there's a dispute that hasn't been resolved or cannot be, hasn't been determined, right, in an agreement ahead of time. We want to be able to bring in an arbitration facilitator, an arbitrator, not the judge. We want to bring in what's called binding arbitration. The reason why I say it's binding is because if there's a dispute between the parties, husband or wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, mom and dad, if there's a dispute, that has to be brought before an arbitrator. It's a private forum. It's private. It's not in the court. It cannot be in the court. If you write this a certain way, this is where all the power is, y'all. We bring in a prenuptial agreement and allow only dispute resolution through private arbitration. If anybody tries to go to the court, with the exception of a claim for abuse or neglect, which we can get around that if there isn't, if there's no evidence of it. If, if anyone, either party tries to go to the court to gain this incentive, to get this reward, to take advantage of the subsidy for separation, like we talked about at the beginning of this discussion, like I mentioned, the judge will have no choice but to defer the matter back to arbitration. He cannot be involved in the merits of the case. It has to go back to arbitration. You hire a private arbitrator according to the contract, and you can make that arbitration, the result of the arbitration, when it's finished, you can make that subject to appellate review in different ways. You can make it subject to appellate review in the court, which is fine because it's not the trial court. We have a big problem with the trial court. Okay, We don't have a problem with the appeals court. We can also, we don't have to go to the appeals court on a postnuptial agreement that's been arbitrated. We can actually set up an appeals panel of arbitrators, three arbitrators, let's say, which constitutes the appeals panel. And we can bring the whole matter to the appeals panel after arbitration, according to the agreement. And we can even do what's called a total review from beginning to end, what's called a de novo review. So we can have an appellate, appellate review panel of a postnuptial arbitration determination award we can have that reviewed in an appeals forum under standards that we agree on. One of the standards being de novo, meaning let's, let's look at all the facts from the beginning. Let's just not look at like one little error or provision of the whole arrangement, okay? You see how powerful this is? Okay, so <clears throat> there are other things in here. I'm not gonna get into all the detail, but I wanted to share this with you, okay? This is another way to manage risk. I mean, I know I just destroy the, the romantic aspect of marriage, okay, and the boyfriend girlfriend live in relationship. Uh, yeah, it's this is just you know a rational way to look at things. But look, when it comes down to it, uh, if you know if you want if you want to bring in the law and things of that nature, it's not romantic, right? So realize that there is that aspect to any relationship. So how do you establish an agreement like this? 
you can do part by part. I've had situations where at the very minimum, I couldn't do much until I got the other party to agree to simply binding arbitration. Okay. Once I got out of the court and we got, had actually had to fire the attorneys. Okay. Sometimes you have to fire the attorneys. Um, if I can do that with one part, at least one party, it kind of derails their game. See, they have a game. I'm not going to get into that too much, but we also want to get away from the attorney's game. We want to get away from the trial court. We want to get away from family court. We want to get away from the incentives, the subsidies that are being uh, awarded to someone wrecking uh, a family okay, or wrecking a marriage. Now, sometimes it's called for. I'm not saying that you know every time it's not, but uh, for the most part, Marriage should be preserved, or relationships should be, you know, that are intended to be long term should be preserved. My intent here is to preserve it and to eliminate the state's ability to get in and interfere with it. No matter what I'm writing here, I'm never going to prevent the state from getting involved where there's a criminal matter. Okay, no problem. I'm never going to prevent the state from investigating abuse or neglect. It should. But having this agreement gives you a leg up, it gives you a lot of power, a lot of power because it defines what the court can do and cannot do. Mostly it's gonna be what the court cannot do. When there's an abuse and neglect, the court has what's called a compelling interest. The state has a compelling interest and that will only take a certain time. In other words, you're gonna end up with an evidentiary hearing in the court and that'll, that should end the matter. And by the way, the results of the evidentiary hearing, if that were to take place, are subject to appellate review. So that's kind of interesting because that can be, that can branch off from this agreement and no one's prejudiced. Just don't be involved in abuse or neglect. Right? Now, if someone wants to make a false accusation, I really feel sorry for that person. Yeah. So, anyways, with that said, I just wanted to share that with you. If you guys want to talk about this, uh, please schedule a time with me or um, join the join the calls. We'll have a call on Thursday evenings. That is announced. In fact, the invitation is is pinned at aceofcoins.com. It's uh, at the bottom of the website, the first page, and also on my Telegram group called Ace of Coins. It's pinned at the top. So uh, if you click on that link on Thursdays at seven Eastern time, Florida time, you can join and talk about this. Now, sometimes I just talk about this. Sometimes I talk about other subjects. Um, if you wanna know in advance, if you want me to talk about this subject, we can certainly do that. If you wanna book a time with me, go to aceofcoins.com, use my calendar and book a time. And I will talk about this. Uh, I will look at your situation. I can talk to yourself and uh, the other party, however you want. And I can suggest a possible agreement. And I have very proven strategies to establish the agreement so that it cannot be broken by you attorneys who don't respect agreements. You don't respect the law. If you don't respect agreements, you don't respect the law. But I'm going to tell you this, you lawyers out there that think you can break my agreement, you won't be able to. You won't be able to. And I know you're thinking to yourself, any agreement can be broken. And that's where you're wrong because you don't respect the law. That just shows that you don't respect the law. So the agreement that I have here will guarantee it will prevent the state from getting involved and abusing either party. It'll, it'll obliterate, it'll remove all the, all the incentives and rewards for what's going on right now. And I'm not gonna tell you the exact secret of how I do it, but it's nothing new. It's just something that's not practiced because if you look around and you talk to lawyers, they're always going to tell you that, oh, yeah, there's always a way to break it. Yeah, because that's what their business is. That's what they do. They practice a tournament. They want to break agreements so that they can get billable hours. Yeah, it sounds very basic. It sounds very mundane, but that's what they do. Um, and this, this is to everyone's detriment. So what my purpose here is to not only avoid that situation, I'm going to avoid cost of litigation because that's what I do anyways. I mean, I do that for businesses. I avoid cost of litigation. This situation here, you're, you're not going to need a lawyer. In fact, you're not going to want a lawyer. You're not going to want a lawyer here. Sorry, lawyers. This is not, when, when my clients have this agreement in place, we don't need you. We don't. So if that appeals to you, I hope it does. Give me a call, set something up. I'd love to discuss it. If you want, we can do a private recording. You can share it with your spouse or not. Uh, you, can, you can go back and reference it. So thanks so much. Uh, appreciate your time.